Okay. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Good, uh, good morning. Uh, it is interesting how time zone works. It's still uh, uh, late uh, evening on Thursday here in uh, North Carolina in the United States, where I'm speaking from you. But uh, in Japan, you are on Friday uh, already, and uh, the sun must be shining bright. Well, we will talk today about the BPF trace, which is a fantastic tool and a great uh, replacement for, uh, for D-Trace. And uh, more specifically, we will talk about uh, the quick review of what uh, BPF and D-Trace are. We will talk about uh, BPF tools landscape in general and what BPF trace tool gives us uh, uh, specifically. Now let's look at the, let's take a look at the instrumentation and durability basics on a very uh, very high level. If you think about the observability, this is our ability to look inside the running system and see uh, what's going on. And if you're dealing with complex systems, as we all increasingly are, it is extremely important for monitoring, troubleshooting, performance optimization, and so on and so forth, right? And for us to see inside that running system, we uh, need to make sure what that is uh, instrumented, right? There are basically some points in the system which capture uh, information from uh, that uh, running system. There are typically two kinds of instrumentation you can speak about static instrumentation and dynamic instrumentation. And I will talk about those two a little bit uh, later in more details. If you think about high level instrumentation uh, approach, you can uh, think about either uh, tracing. That means you have actual places in the code and when the program executes, those places in the code, they emit a particular event when code point is reached, right? Uh, that event may uh, just tell us what something happened or it may give us information about the timing, error code, and a whole worth of additional information as a progress of that event. Another approach, which is also sometimes used, is uh, sampling. So for example, if you are you, uh, have used the tools like uh, O-Profile or P-Prof more uh, recently, those tools essentially sample the state of a system very frequently. And through that, they can understand uh, what's going on in the systems and what states the system spent the most time in, right? These are generally two uh, approaches to, um, uh, to uh, instrumentation. Now, if you look at uh, especially uh, tracing approach, as I mentioned, there are two approaches uh, to that, uh, static and uh, dynamic. If you have a static instrumentation, then you have essentially the very specific uh, uh, counters or login points introduced throughout the code, right? And uh, which compute the statistics or log the data you want to be logged. In this case, we have to be mindful about the overhead and uh, the fact, of course, we only have so many uh, data points we can compute because if you compute too many, it becomes uh, expensive and frankly, you cannot really compute all kind of uh, information stats, uh, right, or anything you can potentially, uh, uh, potentially use. But at the same time, static instrumentation is very useful, right? If you look at the Linux, uh, right, uh, procfs contains a lot of stats, which is derived through various stats implementation and many very good basic Linux performance uh, monitoring and observability tools, VM stat, top, IO stat, and so on and so forth. They are using that uh, static instrumentation. The dynamic instrumentations means we don't know in advance what you want to instrument, and we can take a look at the running system and uh, instrument pretty much mm, anything we want. Obviously, that means with dynamic instrumentation, we can really focus on very particular detail we want to uh, investigate if you have to, uh, 
But at the same time, uh, that is more complicated for users because users have to really figure out what is it what they want to instrument rather than you know working with the basic tools who just show us the right stuff. So if you think about the D-trace, what is D-trace and how it relates to uh, those things I explained, the D-trace is our dynamics tracing framework. Right, so it's focused on dynamic tracing, as the name uh, implies. And uh, this was developed in Sun Microsystems for Solaris, of course, starting in 2001, right? So it has roots going almost 20 years back. It was first released in Solaris, uh, uh, Solaris 10. Uh, and uh, it defined specific trace points in kernel and the user land, right? So uh, you can uh, specify, oh, I want to trace something which is, you know, with some human readable name. Additionally, you can trace arbitrary uh, uh, functions and many more uh, data points. The key, the absolutely genius thing about D-Trace design was, and it was uh, first in its way, it was doesn't have any overhead when uh, not enabled. Right, so a lot of those special names and functions was pretty much something like debug symbols, which were saying where to in, uh, insert the trace, but it did not uh, have uh, any uh, overhead. And other ingenious D-Trace innovation was the D language, which is language inspired by uh, C and awk, uh, which allowed to really uh, write very you know, cool programs. Right, simple programs uh, to compute and analyze uh, results. D-Trace proved to be so good, it went well beyond Solaris. It was added to macOS, FreeBSD, NetBSD, or Oracle, uh, uh, when it acquired Sun, uh, they even ported D-Trace uh, to Oracle uh, Linux as one of the differentiators, right? And uh, later on, they even relicensed the, co the code to be available for Linux mainstream, but it's kind of uh, was too little too late by that time. D-Trace is now even available uh, on Windows. So it is uh, has a pretty uh, broad adoption. Now, if you look at D-Trace on Linux, it's not really available in stock Linux kernel. And it's not available from major Linux uh, distributions outside of Oracle. So that uh, a recent GPL code release was likely too little too late. And uh, Linux over last decade, you know, pretty much figured out a way leaving uh, D-Trace uh, in the dust. So how is tracing implemented in Linux? Linux approach to tracing, as actually to many things, is to let multiple competing frameworks and approaches to exist in the kernel and see which of them over time, uh, over time wins, right? Rather than kind of more of Solaris design where it is mandated, sort of everybody uses the same uh, approach. Right? Now, for more details uh, about this, I really like this uh, fantastic uh, uh, article by uh, Julia Evans, who talks about, li uh, about Linux tracing system. And you can uh, really read a lot about that and with some fantastic illustration. But really, if you think about that, you can see the Linux the tracing infrastructure can be seen as a three different layers. One is type of a kernel interface, right? That's pretty much what do you connect to. The other is once you connect uh, and are able to consume that event, what kind of program is going to be able to consume uh, that event? And the third, now you have all that events uh, somehow produced and processed, what kind of front end, what kind of command line tool, right, or other kind of tool you can use to really uh, work with that information as a user, right? And as you can see in uh, every uh, approach as a, of those, there are uh, 
multiple different ways how you can uh, approach uh, approach tracing right so for example if you're speaking about consuming those events we can choose to store data in the kernel buffer and then pursue uh, consume raw events and user space we can connect the kernel model which can be pretty much any program uh, right uh, compiled and inserted into the kernel or it can be UPF program right which we'll be talking about more now as I mentioned EBPF is really this emergent Linux standard when it comes to uh, 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 dynamic tracing, observability, and actually many other things, right? But where does that EBPF come from and what it is? What the hell is that BPF? Well, EBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet uh, Filter, and it originated uh, or it roots goes far even further than DTrace. Like almost 30 years ago, uh, it was uh, uh, designed as a tool for efficient uh, packet filtering, right? That's what the Berkeley packet filter uh, stands for. And EPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter, extended version which is found in Linux. Over time, Right, and almost 30 years is a lot of time. It evolved to be general event processing framework rather than just a packet filter. And it also acquired now a JIT compiler, so it really can be high performance, high uh, efficiency solution. If you compare EPF and BPF on the high level, uh, we can see what EPF has some advanced stuff, right? It has uh, uh, you know, 64-bit registers, it has a stack, right? And what's most important, it has what's called map. And these are the different special proposed data structures where information can be accumulated and processed, which makes it much more powerful than playing BPF for uh, all kind of different use cases. EPF was in Linux kernels since 2000, uh, 2014, right? I mean, uh, so it's has been uh, in uh, Linux kernel now for what about uh, six years, so it's pretty much sure, and it's at the stage where it gets to the most of their uh, Linux uh, distributions, and it's available in uh, many production installations, which is great. It's still being actively developed. And it's also integrated in the perf tooling system, which is uh, really one of the standard performance optimization tools we all uh, use on Linux. The work is also ongoing. If you check out this uh, uh, the URL I show you on this slide, you will find what, P, uh, what uh, BPF uh, continues to be developed. And uh, even in the very latest kernels, there are some more and more trace points, maps, and some other uh, functionality. Okay, so as I mentioned already, if you look at the EBPF, this is uh, essentially a program which connects uh, the, to the certain points in the kernel. So how does uh, uh, that work? EBPF program is written in the custom bytecode, Right, which Linux kernel can uh, uh, can load. The fact that it's loaded in this custom bytecode uh, means also what uh, those programs can be verified to uh, prevent misuse. Right, I mean uh, maybe they don't uh, uh, get to be uh, verified to protect you from yourself completely, but to remove a lot of risks which come from uh, loading general, uh, you know, machine code in kernel, right, and running that at kernel level uh, privileges. So, for example, EBPF uh, programs, they cannot uh, contain, uh, contain loops because loops are dangerous, right? They, uh, fact that they can, uh, can get to a point that they never, never complete. Now, how do we get that bytecode, custom bytecode? Actually, LLVM compiler can uh, uh, use, uh, compile EPF 
as a target. So you pretty much can write as uh, C, and in some cases you can uh, uh, get the uh, output. The challenge uh, with this is what this compilation is uh, kernel dependent, right? Because a lot of the data structures which you may access in the kernel and so on and so forth, uh, they change with kernel with kernel, and that is one of the, I would say, the challenges of EPF adoptions, and which I know is being worked right now to make it kind of more kernel uh, 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 independent. The good news is while EPF really is this kind of scary custom uh, bytecode, very few will ever need to run EPF programs directly. So here is how the general interaction of the EPF and kernel uh, works. So the user program using probably some of the tools will generate the EVPF of bytecode, which will pass to the kernel, which will verify that and load it as a program, which will connect to one of you uh, trace and interfaces. K probes in a kernel, U probes uh, in a user program, trace points, pair events, and so on and so forth. And as it uh, uh, works, uh, it will uh, store data in maps, as I mentioned, right, which could be something like histogram, right, for example, if I want to collect response time distributions, which then can be asynchronously fetched by, um, uh, by some, of, uh, uh, some of the tools. Now, uh, here is uh, the graph uh, which shows you different events and different kernel uh, versions which talk about what has been instrumented uh, with trace points as uh, it corresponds to the different functionality in Linux kernel. And you can see what uh, majority of the uh, um, uh, uh, interfaces, right, and subsystem is uh, instrumented, as well as there is uh, a very good instrumentation at the uh, various CPU performance metrics, right, so you can the track cycles, instructions, you can track where different cache misses happen and uh, so on and so forth. If you're really interested in uh, D-Trace, you may want to check out uh, the project IOVisor. It contains a lot of great UPF uh, stuff and that is where the latest uh, innovation is happening because in the, while UPF exists, in mainly Linux uh, distributions, it typically is not the latest version. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about EPF uh, overhead, right? And uh, the overhead, uh, of course, is uh, not nil, but it is great to see what it is mentioned uh, in the uh, nanoseconds per call right, not milliseconds, uh, right, or even uh, even microseconds. So what that means is what if you are uh, running medium complexity EVF program, you typically can have hundreds of thousands or even maybe millions of triggers of that EVF program uh, per second, per core, right, before uh, the overhead becomes significant. Right, so, uh, uh, which, which is great. Now, of course, if you really want to hurt yourself, right, and if you create some very complicated EVF program and connect it on uh, very highly triggered kernel functions, you will have kernel performance uh, uh, crawl to halt, but that has to be pretty much delivered, right? It's not that easy to make that mistake. Okay. The next thing to talk about is EVF frontends. So when you speak about frontends, this pretty much means the tools which help us to not to write that pesky BPF bytecode, but instead uh, use some command line tools which do all of that underneath. If you look at the uh, 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 landscape in uh, from 2019, right, which didn't 
change I think that uh, uh, much, right? We can see there is a whole bunch of tools being uh, uh, available. And I took that this slide from Brandon Gregg, right? Which talks about tools based on uh, usability uh, and scope, right? And uh, to what extent the bar is filled is how complete is development of that tool, right? What you can see in this case is what BPF trace kind of really fits in this sort of best zone, right? From one extent, it is has a very high scope, right? It can really do a lot. On the other hand, it's also rather easy of use, and it is also very mature. In fact, uh, at this point, uh, it is uh, the, uh, generally available and has been in the stage for uh, more than a year. Another front end which came to market slightly before BPF Trace was BCC, which also was good and really provided a lot of very you know, cool stuff, but that was not as uh, easy to use. And essentially, when you think about developing new BCC tools. So let's compare those two front ends. If you think as a user, BCC has great set of abbreviated tools which are very easy to use, convenient, and so on and so forth. But developing your own tools, extending, modifying, is not easier. With the F-Trace, it has so far a smaller collection of the tools, at least last time I checked, but it is much easier language to extend, improve, and modify uh, your tools. Let's compare, uh, for example, uh, their uh, you know, program, Right, uh, some uh, uh, the very uh, simple which traces bash commands in BPF trace and BCC. Right, you can probably see uh, how easier to read, uh, right, and how less sort of brutal the BPF code is compared to the BCC code. Right, it's still BCC is still much better than working with BCC uh, uh, EBPF bytecode, but not as, uh, uh, not as easy. If you look at BCC tools available, you can see there is a lot of tools, as I mentioned, and uh, I absolutely uh, love uh, uh, those, right? And especially when they came out, compared to the standard, you know, top VM start and so on, so those uh, tools give you so much more visibility and uh, without adding any overhead, especially when you are not using them, that is, you know, just absolutely uh, fantastic. Okay. The next thing for us to cover is to talk about G-Trace and BPF-Trace, right? How do those, uh, uh, do those uh, compare? Now, if you think about uh, uh, getting things done, Right, when it have to do to uh, virus performance analysis and troubleshooting problem. You can see what if you are in a D-Trace ecosystem, you will use a lot of uh, either D-Trace directly or D-Trace plus shell. In the BPF uh, space, you would use BPF trace for relatively simple one-liners and simple um, uh, simple tools, right? But if you want to write the complicated tools, chances are that is where you would uh, need to use BCC, right? But at the same time, you can see what the BCC, because of what it offers, it is actually much more powerful than you ever could do with uh, Shell uh, and uh, D-Trace. If you look at BPF Trace, BPF trace was inspired by a D trace, of course, right? And it's uh, similar in spirit, but there is no direct uh, comparability. And also because there is many uh, years uh, in the gap between design of those tools, BPF trace is uh, really more uh, powerful. But if you have experience with D trace, you'll probably catch. BPF trace in no time, right? So, for example, here are how different functions and uh, variables and 
worked on uh, called in DTrace and VTF trace, right? And if you just look at uh, this comparison, you'll see, well, it is not the same, but mm, they're kind of similar enough, right? So converting uh, those would not be uh, the major problem. And in fact, that is not the uh, major problem. It is uh, typically harder uh, to, if you want to port a program, let's say from Stellaris, uh, D-Trace, to get the same stuff on Linux, is to find the proper name for a trace point, then uh, to convert the rest of the syntax. Let's look at more uh, details uh, in this case, right? So. This is also now the same program uh, which is uh, uh, implemented in BPF trace uh, scripting language or in uh, DTrace language D. Right? Again, uh, as you can see, the syntax is not uh, exactly the same, but there are, is uh, uh, a lot of things here which are, uh, which are similar. And uh, I would say that BPF trace syntax is designed to be slightly more compact and uh, more clean, if you like. Okay. So BPF trace, how do we get it and what is uh, required? If you look at uh, requirements for BPF trace, uh, these are uh, our requirements. Right, you can see uh, what uh, majority of uh, DPF trace functionality is uh, available with uh, most of the kernels you'll find now running in Wild. Uh, here is very different sort of uh, prefixes. Uh, trace points and uh, other uh, things would uh, uh, hit with uh, BPF trace. And, and again, you can see it really gives us very good uh, coverage of, uh, of different areas of the system uh, and uh, hardware. Here is how BPF uh, trace uh, works, right? As you can see, uh, you get a VPF program, which goes and uh, sort of uh, compiles uh, that program, right, with a parser, then goes through, uh, through C-Lang processor, right, but in the end you would uh, get VPF bytecode, as we discussed then. It gets loaded to kernel uh, and uh, so on and so forth, right? It's interesting what, when you run BPF uh, trace program, in most cases you will see like two events sort of working at the same time, right? You will have a BPF program in the kernel, which is doing all the data gathering, and then your BPF trace essentially blocks or just consume results. And then uh, the program BPF trace, um, or which is runs the script terminates, then the kernel EVPF programs are also mm, unloaded. If you want to run EVPF trades and Linux distributions, you, you'll find not all distributions currently have packages, and also development is fast-paced, so many may have uh, outdated packages, so if you're really into EVPF, you may want to consider uh, new packages. Okay. Uh, now, one way to get EVPF trace is uh, to use uh, snap, uh, right? But we'll talk about limitation what that gives. And when you get uh, that, you will be able to run this kind of nice uh, one-liners like this, uh, which uh, pretty much allows us to uh, trace where uh, IO uh, re request performance by different processes, right? So in this case, we can, the actually quite interesting example of MySQL, which has this kind of double hump performance distribution, right, with this scale, right? It comes from the fact that some requests come from a cache, right, and they're generally fast, and others, 
uh, uh, come from reading the disk. This gives us B model distribution, right? With uh, uh, this, which uh, I think is quite uh, quite cool. Uh, anyway, uh, if you figure out something and say, "Hey, that is a cool one-liner I want to use," you can actually uh, uh, say that in like a read BT file, right? For example, uh, and then run that file um, instead of uh, passing one liner, it will work. Uh, it will work as well. If you look at BPF trace details, you will find what general syntax is uh, kind of quite simple, right? You will have a probe or several probes you attach to. Then you will have a filter, which uh, allows you to filter uh, to more specifically to what to attach to. So, for example, you can say, "Hey." I want to uh, attach to the system call, but only for given process ID, not for everything. And then you have an action which uh, gives us a mini program to run, which can do some math, store data in maps, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, as I mentioned, number of uh, tools which are uh, initially uh, created with BCC are now being ported to BPF trace, right? Which are sort of same functionality, just re-implemented using BPF uh, framework. And here are an example of some of the cool uh, tools, which I think not only greatly usable by themselves, but they also provide good insights about who build uh, uh, build additional tools. Now. If you ever want to see how a BPF code works, well, you can uh, you can do this, right? You can actually do um, uh, minus V for BPF trace, and it will show us uh, the byte code, right? Which is kind of, I don't think, uh, super interesting unless you are a uh, developer, right? But if you I really want to look into how different things uh, of work inside, then you can do that. Okay, now let's do some practice. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say what we want to mm, use BPF trace to trace uh, MySQL, and let's say you want to trace uh, their. Uh, execution of a different queries. In MySQL, there is a dispatch command, which is a pretty much function, which is responsible for uh, executing the query, right, or uh, other commands, right. So, generally, if uh, you look at the uh, printing the second argument of that, that should be the query. If you run this command, though, we will uh, have uh, the uh, the problem. Uh, in this case, what it tells us, oh, what the file MySQL D doesn't exist, even while it's actually kind of does. Well, the problem in this case is, as I mentioned, if I install standard snap package without additional options, it will not uh, have access to random files on the file system by uh, by design, right? And uh, you can uh, either do that, or uh, I just uh, pretty much uh, decided not to mess with it and instead uh, installed uh, the BPF trace through apt package. Now, when you do that, though, we'll get a second problem. Now, we get a problem, hey, symbol doesn't exist, right? Even though... If you ever looked at the MySQL source code, you know there is a dispatch um, command like that. So let's look at the MySQL, or actually in this case that was uh, uh, MariaDB symbols, and see if that symbol of dispatch command actually exists. And you would see it would, but it will have uh, uh, that kind of funny cryptic name. Uh, uh, right, and that cryptic name uh, comes from uh, C++ functions mangling, uh, 
because C++ allows us to have multiple functions with the same name by different signature, right? So to avoid conflicts, it's kind of mangles them in this kind of uh, uh, funny way, right? But now, if uh, we find the right functions we want to do, right, which we did, uh, uh, we can uh, connect to a function and we will see uh, uh, the system output on that are actually their uh, queries, which a system is uh, system is running, right? Which is uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, well, uh, uh, this is a brief uh, introduction to their EVF. If you're really interested in uh, EVF, uh, I would suggest you to. Uh, check out Brandon Gregg's website. He has fantastic uh, set of materials about EPF, uh, you know, write articles, tutorials, and so on. So, and actually, uh, I, uh, you know, can't believe I uh, forgot to include a picture here, but uh, Brandon uh, also published a book at, uh, about EVF, which you, you know, can easily find in a place you find uh, your books for. And uh, that is also a fantastic tool to learn about that. Uh, well, uh, with that, uh, that is pretty much all I have. And I would be now happy to answer your questions if you have any. OK, let's see if I have somebody on chat. Okay, Q&A. Okay, how do we get your, uh, the question is, how do we get your presentation my, uh, material? Well, I will uh, uh, share their, uh, uh, the material with the conference organizers, right? And I would assume it will be shared to give uh, all the other slides. Okay, let's see. Anybody else? Uh, any questions? No, everybody being quiet. Have you guys used EVPF? Anybody use EVPF? You can maybe just type your answer yes, no, whatever in a chat. No? Nobody, nobody home. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. I a little bit more time still. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Tesuke. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, well, well, I probably shouldn't even hope. I'm quite sure I uh, uh, butchered your name. So the question uh, Tesuke uh, has is, uh, do you go with BPF trace straight or use other tools first and end up using uh, BPF trace? Well, uh, in uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, in uh, many cases when you want to get some uh, good uh, insights, you can uh, use the tools which BPF trace already has uh, uh, provided, right? Like for example, uh, there is a uh, other tools to look at the IO latency distribution, right? Which is fantastic way to troubleshoot performance uh, uh, mm, uh, uh, performance uh, uh, problems, right? And that is where I would start. But then you may say, well, you know what? I'm not only interested uh, at the performance of all requests in general, right? I am interested in performance of requests which are more than you know, 
20 kilobytes in size, right, or something like that. Then you can go ahead and modify uh, uh, the, the script. Uh, uh, right to uh, to fit your to fit your needs. That is how I would approach right. And again, I mean, uh, I would say uh, this. In any case, that is typically often a second step after you started uh, looking at some built-in standard Linux tools, which we may be uh, very well familiar with already. Right. Again, top VM starts, net start, right, and so on and so forth. Yes, uh, well, uh, that's cool. I hope if you use uh, Gtrace uh, uh, before, that was helpful for you. AJ was uh, asking or saying, sharing with us what he had experience using Gtrace, but not UPF. Yeah, and uh, Shinzuki uh, is uh, saying what it's uh, very interesting but seems uh, what you need to read the material to understand it. Uh, yes, uh, that is uh, uh, surely the case. Uh, and uh, uh, I would definitely recommend you to, uh, to download and check out the slides when they would be uh, available. Uh, and uh, also, I kind of skip that slide, but I also have a section of a further reading. Uh, in the uh, in the slide deck, if you want to read more about UPF, there is uh, some additional information available. Yeah. So. Yes. So there is a question. Uh, uh, in this case. I won't even try to uh, read that uh, that, uh, that uh, the name. Uh, does BPF trace has significant impact of performance of a system? So, uh, as I uh, mentioned in the presentation, the cool things about BPF trace and uh, all the all the tools, right? What they only uh, add the instrumentation overhead when you instrument something, right? So their instrumentation overhead in most cases is relatively low, like fraction of 1%, maybe 1%, right? So it is actually safe to use uh, in, uh, uh, in production. In uh, some cases, if you have uh, a trace in something like, hey, I want to trace all the system calls in the system, right? and put some very complicated programs on them. Then, in this case, uh, overhead will be high, right? But it's uh, on, uh, uh, right? So it is typically a good idea as you're trying to, to instrument and trace something is to think about how frequent event are you trying to uh, instrument. So Takanori is asking, how much is it difficult to write user line applications with uh, uProbe supporting both uh, uh, both UEPF and uh, and Gtrace? Uh, so uh, in this case, it is uh, you know hard for me to uh, to answer uh, uh, th this question, right? I am not. Uh, uh, Frankly, like quite sure what is uh, uh, th what is the point uh, in uh, the, in this case, right? Like if you would say, hey, I want to uh, get, let's say, some custom probe, and I want to support the users which use both EPF and Dtrace, uh, you uh, you can probably do that without uh, too much of effort because the syntax is uh, quite similar. But uh, what we see typically is uh, users, they would either use one tool or another, right? Or in many cases, maybe even using kind of some high level tool, some graphical user interface, right? Or something. 
Okay. Let's see. Any other questions first? Maybe observations to share? Oh, okay. So, uh, so Takanori is uh, asking what if MySQL supports Solaris and uh, Linux, uh, so MySQL needs to support both EVF uh, and uh, uh, GTrace. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood uh, the question. So, uh, if you uh, if you uh, look at uh, uh, this, is not quite how it works, right? The MySQL itself it does not need uh, to support either EVPF or, or, or DTrace, right? Both those tools are designed so they can instrument any program without uh, that program having any support for that. As I showed in my example, I pretty much pick the function. I'm interested to trace in MySQL, right? And then I did that with EVF, and again, I could do the same in DTrace. Now, at some point in past, uh, MySQL used to have like a specific uh, sort of trace points, like some better human names uh, for uh, DTrace events. Uh, but I think that since has been, uh, uh, has been removed because uh, a uh, vast majority of MySQL deployment is on Linux those days, right? Not on Solaris. So for Shunsuke, uh, if uh, there is, uh, is asking if there is a slide deck URL of those presentations. Uh, uh, no, there is uh, no uh, slide deck URL for this specific uh, presentation. There may be the uh, one similar to what I have uh, presented before. I typically like to give the slides uh, to uh, organizers, right? So they can distribute them uh, according to their distribution policies as a as a courtesy, right? And instead of just having that uh, accessible on the side. Well, Tesuke is asking about explicit trace point in the middle of a function. Is it deprecated or can it be used uh, as a complementary one? Well, um, I think the point is if you have an explicit trace point which is uh, defined, in many cases it is quite, uh, uh, quite convenient uh, to use, right? More convenient than a function. And another value of a specifically named trains point is what they can be stable uh, where source code may be changing between major versions, the functions may be removed, uh, renamed and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and then their instrumentations programs break. While uh, the trace points, the typically developers take them on themselves to maintain uh, they're much better, right, than than function names which they consider their own business. Okay. Well, uh, any more thoughts, questions? I, I think we have uh, just about a minute left of our generously allotted time.
Okay, well, thank you for uh, all your questions and for your wonderful participations. I know it's not as easy to participate in a, uh, a virtual event as in a face-to-face -face one. So uh, that was a pleasure. Thank you.